I think the most accepted version of workplace bigotry is ageism. And oh, okay. definitely I've been too young for some jobs, according to the employers. I am now in a position where I feel like I might be less hireable now that I'm older. Hey, fellow workers, my name is Kim Seaver, and you have tuned in to episode two of season two for the Alberta Worker Podcast. We are a proud member of the Labor Radio Network, as well as, brand new this season, a member of the Harbinger Media Network. We are broadcasting from the territory of the Nitsapi, and I am pleased to welcome aboard our guest, Jeff Graham, who is a member of the community here in Lethbridge. Welcome, Jeff. Hi, thanks for having me on. Totally excited to be on the other side of this equation. I'm already feeling like, ah, look, what is this what I do to other people? That's that's what I'm thinking already. Great. Awesome. So why don't we just get straight into it? So how about you just tell uh, me and my listeners your life story, you know, where you grew up, what your family life was like education, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and then also tell us uh, your personal labor history, your first job, um, subsequent jobs, what you do for a living now. You can either do that at the end or you can intersperse it with your life history, whatever you want. Nice. We'll try and throw it together in a tellable story. So I was born here in Lethbridge at the St. Mike's, which is now a palliative care center. My dad was born here at the Galt. His dad was born in Standoff. His dad was born here in Lethbridge. So I got a bit of history here and I kind of take a bunch of pride in being a fourth generation citizen of Lethbridge for sure. Grew up pretty normal, had a weird appendicitis thing where when I was five and due to a high pain threshold, found myself not being able to move my leg rather than recognizing a tummy ache. So they're trying to diagnose my leg. And so that was episode one of Jeff being a medical experiment where I was one of the first IV fed people on planet Earth. It's very cool. Uh, other than like potential wow. obvious test subjects, it was just sort of a, a happenstance where my nurse knew the guy that worked on the machine. So I got one and I'm here telling the story about it. Low middle class family, if that's even still a thing anymore. If we designate regions within a class, I would put it there. Like we had a car and a half most of the time. There was never not food on the table. Didn't have those kinds of things growing up. Dad was civil servant. Mom contracted the Alberta government so that we could uh, look after failure to thrive children. And none of them failed to thrive, so we were pretty good at it. Um, <laughs> and that's a big part of how I grew up. My brother and I are the natural borns of the 79 children that went through the house. That affected a lot about how I view how people treat others, especially adults versus children. And I do mean it almost like a versus, and it, it shouldn't be that way. So anyway, that was a big part of my growing up life first job I might have been nine or ten and I used to deliver flyers for somebody that lives near Kiwanis Park there I think she still distributes flyers with youth I don't know nice, nice enough lady that was my uh, first job too <laughs> the flyer delivery at per cent cents per delivery right <laughs> uh Aquafresh came out that was seven cents a tube delivered I was excited right borrowed a wagon carried a bunch joined the cadet program around the same time part of that I guess it was in the family in the area but a lot another part of it was just things to be done it seemed like a skill set that was a beavers I was a beaver I was a cub and scouts was just more of those so to join a Navy branch was a different of the same thing. Like it's a structure, an organization, a place to learn, meet people. Did a lot of the meeting people thing. Then around 12, picked up a job going door to door, making appointments for salesmen. We were selling magnetically self-sealed acrylic windows. That's what it was. So as a 13-year-old commission, a little weird, a little weird work in that way. But then again, cadet, so my summer was busy. I wasn't really looking for a job. I was just looking for cash to have because parents weren't flush, right? So I just wanted to get the extras was on me, I felt anyway. Um, jibs and drabs of jobs all through like school. Like I worked for one of the real estate guys in town remodeling their rental properties. Like someone would move out, I'd go in, recover the place. Me and that guy's brother-in-law. We were like 16 or something. We were doing that kind of work. There's always that kind of fill-in jobs, I guess, because I never wanted to tie up my summer because I was always counting on a cadet camp, that next level of training, that actual verifiable paycheck that I knew what the amount would be near the end. 
other than my own miscalculations, right? Lucked into a thing in like grade 12 where the sea cadets were like, hey, we're going to send you to sea. You get to go to Japan and Korea and Hawaii. It's going to be like three months of just being at sea with the Navy. Wow. And I said, that sounds great. Great. When do we go? And they're like, well, go the first of May. So I was in high school at the time. And so I came home that day, looked at my mom, said, mom, dropping out of school. <laughs> and she said, okay, sure. Why are you doing that? I said, oh, so I can go to sea. She's like, sure. Okay. Bit of a surprise to her. Right. Yeah. Um, I was a weirdo and had all my classes lined up such that my last semester of grade 12 was kind of unneeded other than social studies. So I just challenged that test. And so I was able to do real sailor duty as opposed to the many other cadets that came with me that were still classed as children and so could only work till 11 etc cetera, etc cetera. Oh, okay. uh, i didn't actually turn 18 till my after a month at sea but that's a different story that's a thing about being on a boat registered in bc uh, so i'm off off to go die but i can't vote for the people that are sending me and i can't have a beer before it happens <laughs> <laughs> Just a weird thought, just the way the system works. Yeah. Uh, totally discarded all of that training. Used my audition tour that we got out of high school to go to college and theater. All of the military training just set it aside because of moments like could go and die for the guy that I didn't get to vote for. Absolutely. Um, things like that made me reconsider that course of life. I went to college, took acting, did that for a couple of years because I didn't want to hear no that often as an actor. Because sure. I feel like I'm pretty good because that's a thing I've been doing in the background and continue to do. So I'm at like 40 some years of doing the acting thing. Um, Where did you go? Cool. Oh, read your college. Read your oh, college. Okay. It was the third year of their program. Okay. So cool. I, I felt like, oh, this is like a fresh built learning adventure. And, and for sure, for sure. And working with the actors that go through the university program now, things have changed, which is totally cool. And that way I still get to learn more. Then I came back, took a year at the local college here in Lethbridge because I was looking at conservation enforcement, thought I'd be a forest ranger. Oh, okay. And actually, this might be the one and only time I think I ran into a problem due to my race, actually. Uh, at the Going into the summer that year, they were looking for the training of uh, firefighters, but I wasn't the ethnicity they were looking for, which I get it. Let's have the people that live near those areas apply first or something reckless like that right. um but i thought if they're just short of bodies they should just take bodies but so i don't know what the hiring turnout was i just felt that at that time anyway they were suggesting we should use the natives in the area and i was suggesting i'm just a body if you need a body so i wasn't sure if it was actually racial or just regional right but that's, that's as close true. as i've ever really come to anything like that based on who I am or where I'm from or any of those things in a work a day world. Anyway, that's for sure. Let's see. Got married, had kids, lived in Red Deer for another couple of years to just work because wife got transferred up there. Well up there, got divorced. <laughs> I came down here with kids, raised two fabulous kids on my own. They are now, you know, mid to late twenties, those kids. So I think I've done all right. They're not a burden on society. They kind of are to benefit, I think. So that's, that was my goal. Give them all the tools they need for success and let them sort it out, right? Free range parenting wasn't popular in my peer group, but that's how I did it. Jobs, I cooked. I cooked because, A, I really like the adventure. The stress level actually is not bad for me. The fact that someone comes in hungry and I can make something and 12 minutes later, they're satisfied. That has a serious job satisfaction rate. And my ADD plays well into that short ticket time. That's um, true. What that didn't do was make it easy to raise those two kids on my own. Yeah. Uh, Baker found me a job with her husband at a battery store. Quick plug, ultra battery. Um, been there. And I've been I've been there like 19 plus years now. So that's. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I've learned, I still learn there. And it gives me all my options to do the hobbies I like to do, especially the acting. It gave me the time to raise my kids and easy to stay there. Boss is super loyal to me. So it's easy, easy for me to stay there. Because I can yeah. always go to cooking. There's always a need for a cook right now. <laughs> That'll be one of the last of the AI bastions, I think. Every time I go to Ultra Battery, I keep thinking, okay, they're not going to have this battery. And they always <laughs> have it. They have every kind of battery there. I'm so surprised. We, we, we sure try. They obsolete some on us. But and then that's a thing. Like, it's a local business. And, and surprisingly, it's a war I've been in pretty much my whole life. Just because it's from Lethbridge doesn't make it suck. 
right? Like, <laughs> there's just such the opinion of people in Lethbridge that think, well, if it's from Lethbridge, anyone could have done it. Well, no, that's the story of anything anywhere. Anyone could do it. It's that someone did do it and the thing is good. And surprisingly, it also comes from Lethbridge, right? Yeah, totally. Cool. That's it. That's Jeff in a nutshell. I mean, I totally do all the crazy things in between, but, you know, done the skydiving, done the scuba diving, done stuff, right? I don't feel like I've missed out on life's adventures. That's for sure. That's for sure. Nice. Some of them are cost prohibitive, right? Love to tour the world two or three times, but, eh, you know, take what yeah. you can get. That's right. Yeah, it's cool. Um, it's nice to have, you know, a steady paycheck and gives you some dependability and it makes it easier to plan things and gives you some free time and that sort of thing. So totally get it. Yeah. Uh, what do you do at Ultra Battery? So uh, that's one of those loaded questions. So technically we are unskilled labor, right? There's no technological certification or trade certification that we can get for, for what we do. I mean, I've been told we can create the program and teach this at the college, but that's a separate career choice to be the instructor of this thing. So I randomly refer to myself as the battery technician or fire extinguisher. Um, because lots <laughs> of times little problems come up and I've been there long enough that I can quickly put them out. Uh, but overall, I deal with like most of the remanufacture of batteries, like your older drill packs, alarm panel packs, specialty hospital packs. I mean, I have this week off from doing that and I sit here in my brain going, I hope they don't get too many. Because I've been there long enough, I can get them done more quickly. Experience does that, right? Just like right. the cell phone guy, I can do that job. That is not the most time effective way is to let me do that job, right? So we all do the car batteries. We all can wire an RV. We can all put together the golf carts, floor scrubbers, weird things that people don't think of. And then we do solar on the side. So I have to know a bunch about solar stuff. I, I mean, I know how the batteries work and that's just been an accumulation over the years. And again, I guess that's where we could build this course. We could put it at the college and we could teach others, but our shop is kind of unique, right? There aren't a bunch of shops like ours. I know right. for sure in, in, in the UK, there's no such thing as just a battery store. I was there, there aren't, <laughs> which works well the other way because people that sell things there support their things better. Right. If you were to buy a cell phone, you could go to the cell phone place. They'll have the cell phone battery. They'll put it in. Right. They support their products. Whereas you buy a cell phone here, you're like, oh, I hope it works. Oh, where do I go? Yeah. So that's how we've been able to pick up that battery end of it. Right. Right. Honestly, though, like if Ultra Battery wasn't there, there are a few times I could think it was like, how would I get a replacement battery? I'd either have to buy a new device or maybe like buy on Amazon, but then you don't know where it's coming from, who manufactured it or anything like that. So, I mean, and that's a twofold win, I think for like, I get a bunch of satisfaction out of, well, not getting the new sale, right? Like, I don't think the guy that's selling new needs the new sale every time. When people say things aren't built to last, parts of things aren't built to last, right? Like a DeWalt right. drill, the drill still works as your battery went sad. That's so true. I can save landfill, I can take out the parts that are easiest to recycle, replace those parts, make your drill still work again. And that's less energy created in making a new drill. That's all of those things, right? Yeah, uh, our microwave recently went on the fritz. And after some research, I'm pretty sure it's one of two fr fuses or maybe both fuses. If I could test those fuses and replace those fuses, it should work again. So yeah, like the microwave for the most part still works. It's just a couple of small pieces <laughs> that are no longer working. If I can replace those, then it's back to normal. So yeah, and, totally. And yeah, yeah, exactly right. Like just to make use of the thing you already have seems just better, especially when, I don't know, whenever economies are down, right? I'm in a weird position at my shop that way, where if economies are up, right, then people are spending extra, then I can support their new idea, their new project, their whatever they're doing new. If the economy's down, people have to make use of their old things, and I can help them do that more efficiently with a warranty. That's another reason I can still be there this long, right? Like I'm not just, it's not a assembly line job, which I know for sure makes me mental. I did data input, it lasted a day. Yeah. Uh, it was cash in the early 90s at like 20 bucks an hour. And it was my brother, and I still said no. Yeah. <laughs> After day one, I just looked at him and said, no, man. I, what do you people do? How can, like, you can't pay enough. Yeah, my third job in Lethbridge was data entry, and man, it sucked. Just sitting there, staring at the screen, typing. It's like, oh, I hate this. 
Well, and after the first hour, I don't know if I've made a mistake or if that's the new data entry. I just stare at it, right? Yeah, I helped try to convert Parrish and Heinbecker when they installed their new computer system. So that was just changing okay. one to a dash one, changing two to a dash two. So that's not for me because that's where the cooking was good or this interchange I can have at the store where I can deal with a customer. No two people are the same and this doubly true of the customers. And then I can also hide out in my little room and weld a couple of batteries together when the customers have overwhelmed me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, that story and and so quickly too. You're pretty succinct. <laughs> <laughs> I never know what interests others. I just try and hit the highlights and hope they dig for questions. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So you said that your dad was a civil servant. Are you comfortable being a little bit more specific and what oh, kind of work he did? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He worked in the soil physics lab. He was a technician out at uh, Canada Agriculture. Oh. Okay. Which at the time. He was a dude with a degree so he could get a job. His actual degree is in zoology. Knew how to write science papers, knew how to do lab work, got a job with the government. I mean, it works out now. He's old, he's retired, he's got pension and benefits. Both parents were military to an extent. Like mom was a cadet officer on the army side and my dad was twice actually the commanding officer of the militia unit out here. Now he and just hosts out at the museum. Is that why you decided to go in the cadets? Is because of that background? Part of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, even exposure to the idea that that existed was part of it. But for sure, I think the Navy choice to make sure I wasn't part of whatever they were doing, right? Like I could see maybe that the pomp, the pageantry, the parades, that's all cool and impressive to me. And it still is. I, who doesn't love a parade? If it has fanfare and, and ribbons, cool, right? I think that I wanted it to be different enough. So I didn't choose an army path, I chose a Navy path. Plus, I think age. I think the Navy has a younger branch, like in the Navy League program, where they can start you younger yeah. than the other branches of cadet service could. Okay, cool. Well, I admire that. I tried to do air cadets, but I couldn't hack it. My older brother was in air cadets, and then my younger brother and I, we decided to hang out because they had like an information session night or something. They were teaching everybody about uh, how planes work and stuff. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. So we signed up and then every time we showed up, it was just marching, 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 marching. All we did was <laughs> march. It's like, oh my goodness, this is enough. We went on a camp, which is pretty cool. But other than that, like all we did was march. And it's like, I'm not doing this anymore. So I admire yeah, yeah. you for sticking with it. Because <laughs> if you get the rationale behind, you know, uniform and, and the like-minded thinking, it, it's, it goes back uh, well before the Roman era. If you can get all your soldiers thinking and doing the same, you're just going to be a more effective unit, right? Oh, yeah. No, I, I absolutely but it, get it. But, but when you're in the old. middle of it, that is just a bunch of trees for the forest you're in, right? Yeah, totally. And um, what do your children do now? Are they in school or are they working? Yeah, so so my daughter's had a bit of a rough mental goal. Uh, so not doing much right now, but I'm in a position, fortunately, that I can look after her. Oh, cool. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm well aware that I'm in the special status of currently not disabled rather than thinking, you know, oh, I'm an able-bodied person. Eh, not so much, right? One day, sooner or later, whether it's like someone in their knee, for example, or just getting aged out, right? I'm just exactly. currently non-disabled, right? So Every, I hope everybody will be disabled will, at some point. We all will, like all of us. That's my message quickly. So yeah, easy to look after her. She contributes around the house, does things. She's not just there being a lump or anything. And then I'm kind of super lucky. I mean, I think I am. I don't know if he does. Uh, my son works with me five almost five years ago i got oh. a, got his foot in the door and that's all i was willing to do for him he said i don't know Ooh, working with dad Ooh. then he kind of is picking up things and now he's probably within a month or two of being my manager right i'm of a position where i don't want to do that i don't want to worry about the work others do i mean i do anyway it's part of the team but i don't want to be responsible i don't want to have to make those calls anymore if i was 30 sure i'm all over it put me in charge let me be whatever i need to be to do the job but i think for the health of the company going forward it makes zero sense to train the old guy to take over management for the long term health of the company right like it just makes more sense when they first asked me i said no give it to peter peter's now my manager now when they're like well we need another guy i'm like yeah this guy, this guy that shows up every day, right? Like I don't, I can work for him. No problem. Yeah. Somebody who's going to be there for, you know, a few more decades. Yeah, exactly. Like it's healthier for the company. People that are part of the emerging market rather than people that are fighting for their gas cars. Yeah. Right. right. I mean, yeah. I have other fights for my gas car because I understand what it takes to make a lithium battery, but that's, that's just for now anyway.
until sure. we can get a hydrogen car, I'm I'm good with my gas car. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might be waiting for a while on that one. Yeah, yeah, about a decade. <laughs> <laughs> the Alberta Worker Podcast is a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Here's a jingle from another member of the network. Hey folks, it's Bama Athreya, your host on The Geek Podcast. You can find us on Stitcher, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And this show is now part of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. You can discover more than just us by visiting their website at laborradionetwork.org. The Labor Radio Network will help you find your favorite union podcast or radio show, besides this one, of course. And now, back to the show. You're listening to the Alberta Worker Podcast. So at the end of everybody's life story, I always ask them another question. And I think you might have already answered this, but we'll just see where it goes. How has your intersections of marginalization, if any, ever influenced your experiences as a worker? And that could be gender, ethnicity, religion, uh, sexual orientation, economic status, whatever. Yeah, now that I've had extra minutes to dwell on it, I think the most accepted version of workplace bigotry is ageism. And definitely I've been too young for some jobs, according to the employers. I am now in a position where I feel like I might be less hireable now that I'm older. And I hear that out in the community of people around my age when suddenly they find themselves without a job. They think, what do I do? right? What what am I trained to do? How much experience from my previous 10-year job can I bring to this new thing that I'm excited about, right? The last few months, uh, first half of this year, I was looking in the job market and checking out for jobs and it's tough. And I'm 50 years old myself. People just don't want to hire 50-year-olds, especially speaking of disability, especially people with disabilities. So I'm limited into what I can do. I can't do really physical labor anymore. And honestly, I can't even sit for long periods either. People just don't want to hire 50 year olds. They want to hire someone who's younger. So yeah, I totally understand that. Unless you were a car salesman, you're kind of eat. Like I've done the sales, like of the jobs that not listed. Worked for a company called Filter Queen, which some would think it's a vacuum cleaner, but it isn't. It's an air purification system with 26 household functions. So, I mean, I get that level of sales too, right? The hard clothes, the soft clothes, all of those things fill the pieces of who you are. Like when I talk about my hobbies, that's a more likely place that I would run into any of the ethnic stereotyping. And yet, weirdly enough, I often get what I would call the psycho-ethnic role. And also in terms of the work for nothing, I'm on the board for Lethbridge Shakespeare Performance Society, the board for Playgoers of Lethbridge. And then I recently joined the Provincial Alberta Dramatist Festival Association board. So, I mean, that's where my job's cool. It gives me the time to do three boards plus the show I'm in, plus plus. But I think, yeah, age, I think as a youngster, I found it hard to get jobs because lack experience. And I think as I get older, people are concerned that you're set in your ways as well. Like, oh, this old guy, what can I teach him? And again, I think my industry is a bonus that way because we are just like politicians. We are unskilled labor. There's no trade certificate for us. There's no standard that I have to meet. There's nobody sitting there going, well, if you've been in the industry this long, you should do blah, 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 right? No, yeah. no, one, no one has that kind of template they can apply to what we do. So no one can say, well, you're getting too old. I mean, I feel like I'm getting too old to put in a couple of diesel batteries at minus 40, but not really. It's just, I, it sucks being cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get that. All right. So then final thing that I always ask my guests as well. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? I'm going to chuck in a quick plug for myself just while I'm at it. So my brother and I, we have a little radio thing we do on the Jess FM, uh, which is a community station, again, where we are critical of thoughts, ideas, opinions, and beliefs. And the reason I made this show is because I don't think we can all know everything, but we should all pursue the knowledge of everything. And there's got to be a way to sort out, to be epistemologically consistent, to just have these things and just be able to sort them more quickly, but to be fair and honest to each and everything that comes my way. So I want to be critical of those things. And so I think that's what I want to share, that I think you don't have to be open-minded to anything. You just have to accept everything and then let your mind decide if it's usable information or not. It it doesn't require open-mindedness to accept things. Accepting things is easy. It's what you do with do with those things. It's how you sort those things. It's the reliability, the model you can make with those things that people tell you that should clue you in as to where those things live, right? right. Like, a, it, that, like a flat earth example. If someone tells me they believe the earth is flat, I can accept that they believe that. No problem. No problem. 
then I start digging into how come they think that that's where the how did you get there comes from is the what would make you think the earth is flat? What are some things that we could use to determine other things aren't flat or are flat by the same criteria? Right. right. So yeah. I think if people can be that sort of consistent with all of the claims they give as well as the claims they take, then you're less likely to find yourself guessing. Right. And if you don't know something, just say that. I don't know. Like it's it's a crappy answer but it's an honest answer and what's the name of your show on just fm yeah it's called how did you get there and we stream on like roku in italy on sh 101 oh, wow. uh, facebook and if ever i'm smart enough i'll hit the twitter button too and we'll have a little purple line one day i don't know i'm told we're set up for that but i am not the technician for sure we're All looking right. for a producer that's just as volunteer as we are <laughs> i'll be sure to put links to all that and the show notes for the listeners in case they want to check you out anywhere else the people can follow you if they're interested in learning you more betcha i am on the twitter at h-t-y-g-t-y-q-l that's how did you get there less bridge i'm a bit snarky but sometimes i'm also just promoting community things that are going on like i don't know if you caught on the twitter it seems that the theoretical brewing the owner is taking herself off of the twitter just due to twitter being the same always um, and whereas I only joined Twitter to promote my talk show. So <laughs> I, my account says I've been there for a year and a half or two years or whatever. I, I still feel new to Twitter, <laughs> but feel free to contact me there. Send me thoughts, ideas, questions for the show. Sure. And you said you are in a show with New West this season? No, not New West. I, oh. So that's a weird New West is amazing. And those are the professionals and hats off to professional theater. Um, no, on Lethbridge Shakespeare Performance Society. In fact, we're on oh, tonight. Okay. We're doing we're doing some little warm up first thirds of the show tonight and tomorrow night in the nice. Festival Square. Okay. And, but yeah, it's Taming of the Shrew, and we'll be going to the middle of summer, middle of August. Awesome. All right. Yeah. So I was in. Actually, both of us were in the inaugural season for Shakespeare in the Park here in Lethbridge. So if people who live in Lethbridge or people who are visiting Lethbridge this summer want to take out check out Shakespeare in the Park, it's going to be at least once a week in Galt Gardens and there'll be alternative performances as well. Yeah, yeah. We're up in Legacy and a few at the Japanese Garden in case you want to wine and cheese it a little. Uh, we also go out of town to Fort McLeod, High River, Nanton. Wow. We get out and around the community. Really expanding since the, the performance I did. <laughs> yeah, 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 oh, yeah. It, that's where it's like an extra week, I think, over our first season. But our pittance is a little higher. <laughs> sure. So I'm, I'll put that in the show notes as well. Cool. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks, Jeff, for joining us today. If anybody is interested in following The Alberta Worker, you can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, and Twitter, LinkedIn. You can also visit us online at albertaworker.ca. You can sign up for our newsletter there. We send out a daily, weekly, and monthly email newsletter summary of the most recent articles we've written. If you like this podcast, please rate it and review it in your favorite podcast app. If you are interested in supporting the Alberta Worker, you could do so at our website, albertaworker.ca slash support. Alberta Worker and this podcast are made possible because of listeners like you. If you're interested in being a guest, you can email the Alberta Worker at podcast at albertaworker.ca or you can send us a DM on one of our social media accounts. Thanks again, Jeff, for joining us today. Thanks everybody for tuning in. And as always, solidarity. Right on, man.